holy word. Assist us with thy spirit that it may be written in our hearts to our everlasting comfort. To reform us, to renew us according to thine own image. To build us up into the perfect building of thy Christ. And to increase us in all heavenly virtues. Grant this, O Heavenly Father, for the same Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Well, obviously not everybody got the memo. We were still having Sunday school today. Or maybe they just didn't want to have to muscle through the smell of all that bacon back there as we get ready for the annual meeting. But we are going to continue with our study of the Epistle to the Philippians. So if you have your Bibles or you want to log on on your phone, uh, you can do that. We are going to take a look at just a few verses here in Philippians. It's hard to believe, but we're only going to look at two verses, and they are not really what we would call the content of the epistle. And yet what's amazing, even about these words in the introduction, is that nearly every single one of them is pregnant with meaning. So that's what we want to do today. So Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. We said last week when we first started this study of Philippians that this was a church that Paul had established on his first missionary journey. It's generally the case with Paul's epistles, not always, there are exceptions to this, but it's generally the case with Paul's epistles that when Paul wrote letters to churches, he was writing to churches that he had established with whom he had a pastoral relationship, and oftentimes he was writing to address specific concerns in the life of those churches. Uh, That is certainly the case with uh, the churches in Galatia, for example. Paul was deeply concerned about a group known as the Judaizers who were trying to come into those churches, infiltrate those churches, and suggest that in addition to believing in Jesus Christ, other things were necessary for salvation. And Paul wrote that epistle to the Galatians to correct that false belief. Um, His two epistles to the church in Corinth are like that. There were all kinds of problems in the church in Corinth. I've described the church in Corinth as Paul's problem child. And uh, Paul wrote those two epistles to address the problems that existed in those churches around Corinth. There are, as I said, exceptions to this. Um, Paul wrote his epistle to the Romans. That's often considered to be his greatest, weightiest epistle. Paul did not establish the church in Rome. Um, That church was already in existence in the imperial capital. But Paul knew that it had strategic importance, and so he wrote the epistle to the Romans to be an encouragement to that church as an apostle. In the case of the church in Philippians, uh, Paul is really writing, we said last week, to encourage them and to fill them with a sense of joy. And that is the theme that sort of runs through this epistle, uh, a rather short epistle, but it's the theme that runs through from start to finish. Now, the letter begins in a typical way, uh, the way most letters in the ancient world began. Um, We don't write letters like this today. Well, we don't write letters anymore at all, I don't think. We write emails, don't we? Uh, Which, by the way, is something that's very alarming to historians um, because um, emails can be deleted. Emails can disappear into the ether. And um, so you don't have an historical hard record anymore. So... I encourage you to continue writing letters. It's an important thing. It's also a helpful exercise in putting your thoughts down on paper. One of the dangers of email, of course, is that you just sort of type something and you hit it, and once it's gone, it's gone. And uh, sometimes we regret sending that email. Um, But that's not how they wrote letters in the ancient world. And even when we did write letters, we wrote them differently than the way Paul did it. Oftentimes when we write letters today, um, what you do is you address the person who's going to be the recipient, and then you write your letter, and it's only at the end that you what? You sign your name. Uh, That wasn't the way it was in the ancient world. Uh, What would happen is that the author would establish his credentials at the very beginning of the letter. Uh, That's what Paul did in many places. Where his apostleship was questioned, Paul would oftentimes say, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. Because there were some churches that questioned Paul's apostleship. Remember that what Paul had been in those years prior to his conversion, he had been a persecutor of the church, and many people knew that. And so Paul sometimes felt the need to establish his apostleship at the very beginning of the letter. The reason why his people should listen to him 
is because he was one specifically chosen by God to carry on Jesus' ministry in the world. So normally letters had the name of the sender, the name of the recipient, and then greetings. That's normally the way it was done, and this follows that typical pattern. But there are some elements, even here in these first two verses, that set Philippians apart from the other classical letters that you would find in antiquity. There is a distinctively Christian focus. Paul describes himself here as a servant of Christ Jesus. Now, we looked at this briefly last week, and we said that the word that is translated servant or servants is the Greek word doulos. It means more than just a servant. Uh, In the 19th century, people would sometimes sign letters, your obedient servant. Uh, The word that Paul uses here is more than just servant. It is a word that literally translated means slave. That's how Paul was depicting himself, as a slave of Christ Jesus. Interestingly enough, this is the very same word that Paul uses to describe Jesus Christ. Uh, If you take uh, a look further on, uh, what you will discover is that Paul uses this word. In fact, you can take a look at it. Just turn one page in your Bible to Philippians chapter 2, and you'll notice that he uses the exact same term to describe Jesus. He says in chapter 2, verse 5, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. He's writing to Philippians, and he said, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he made himself nothing and took the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. It's the word servant, how we translate it, but literally translated it means slave. So Paul is saying to these people, I am a slave. I'm a slave of Christ Jesus. And he's a slave to Christ Jesus because Jesus Christ, though he was in very nature God, nevertheless became enslaved for you. And for me, it's worth pondering slavery in the ancient world. We hear a lot of talk about it today here in America. We talk about reparations for slavery and so forth. It's interesting to talk about slavery in the ancient world and what it was like. There were three ways that you could become a slave in the ancient world. And incidentally, slavery was rampant in the ancient world. In fact, they used to say in the first century, at least half of the population was enslaved to the other half of the population. So you have to bear that in mind when you think about these terms. You, know, you, you can't project back in history our own attitudes and beliefs about these things. You have to put yourself in context. You take anything out of context and you're going to misunderstand it. So slavery was rampant in the ancient world, and there were three ways that you could become a slave in the ancient world. You could become a slave by birth. In other words, if your mother or your father were slaves, then you were automatically a slave by virtue of your birth. You could become a slave in the ancient world by means of conquest. That is to say, if another nation came in and defeated your nation in a war, then you automatically became slaves, vassals of the conquerors. Incidentally, this is really what the Jews were at the time that Jesus was operating. They were, for all intents and purposes, slaves of the Roman Empire. And Jesus actually got into a, a, an argument with the Pharisees and the religious leaders on this uh, point at one, on one occasion. Uh, we're told that they were arguing back and forth, and uh, Jesus was telling them that they were basically enslaved, and their answer was, we are the children of Abraham and never been the slaves of anybody. Which was an extraordinary thing for them to say, because if they knew their own history, and of course they did, they had been slaves any number of times. In fact, at the time that they were delivered from their captivity in Egypt, they were what? Slaves. slaves. And they'd been slaves to the Babylonians, and they'd been slaves to any number of people, and for all intents and purposes, as I said, in the first century, they were slaves of the Romans. So slavery was rampant in the ancient world. You became a slave by birth, by conquest, or by debt. In other words, if you acquired a massive debt and you were incapable of paying it off, you became a slave to the person to whom you were indebted. Now, Paul describes himself as a slave. Here's what's interesting. All three of these ways that a person became a physical slave in the ancient world correspond to the way that you and I are slaves. You may not think of yourself as a slave, 
But this is the teaching of the Bible, that you and I, every single one of us, is a slave. We are slaves to sin. A slave is not free to do what he wants to do, is he? He is is bound to his master. Well, there's a sense in which you and I are slaves to sin. If you don't believe me, just think about what Paul says. The very things I want to do, I do not do. And the very things I hate, these are the things that I find myself doing, O wretched man that I am. Can anybody relate to that? Are there, any, are there any moments in your life when you know that there are certain things you want to do, certain things you know you ought to do, but you discover that you have not the power, the wherewithal to do with them? The desire, but, but not the strength. How many of you have ever been there? Or there's those other things that you know you ought not to do, but you nevertheless find yourself falling into them over and over again. An older generation called these besetting sins. If you can relate to that, then you can understand what Paul means when he says we're slaves. And sometimes we look at ourselves and we say, oh, goodness, how did I fall into that wretched man, woman that I am? Who's going to deliver me? You know, there are just some people. There are just some people in your life. Let's be honest with you. You have every intention of treating them with respect, or with dignity, and with love, and they just say one thing (laughs) that sets, you know those people, that just sets you off. And and you say the wrong thing, and you walk out of the room, and you say, I just can't believe I did that. That was oftentimes my relationship with my father, to be perfectly honest with you. There were just times when he would just, he just knew how to get under my skin. I mean, he, he had a master's degree in it. I mean, he could really do it. And then I would shoot off my mouth, we'd get into an argument, I'd walk out the room and say, now I know better than that. If you can relate to that, then you understand what it means to be a slave. And the Bible says in the same way that you became a slave physically, you become a slave to sin. We are all born into it. David in Psalm 51 says, before I was even born in my mother's womb, I was a sinner. We are all OS positive. Original sin positive. This is one of the reasons why one of the first words that children learn to say when they come out and they begin to talk is, no. (laughs) St. Augustine said, the innocence of children has nothing to do with the purity of their soul, just the smallness of their stature. The older they get, the more capable they are of getting into trouble. So we are born into it. Proverbs also speaks of sins that have control over us, that reign over our lives. So there is a sense in which we are conquered by sin. And then, of course, we become slaves by debt. Paul says the wages of sin is death. That's the payment for it. That's the penalty for it. So there is a sense, Paul says, in which we are all slaves. Now, just as you could become a slave in antiquity in three ways, there were three ways in antiquity for you to gain your freedom. One way was you could earn your freedom. Uh, A slave, for example, who did some great um, service for his master or in service of the state, the empire, could be granted freedom. Uh, We know that in the 19th century. Um, Slaves were oftentimes freed by their masters because they did something that was deserving of freedom. And so in the ancient world, you could earn your freedom. You could actually purchase your freedom. If you were indebted to your master, you became their slave, but it was one of those things where you were more like an indentured service. You worked off the time. And so it was possible with with enough time and enough energy that you could actually purchase your freedom. Slaves in the 19th century in the South could actually, from time to time, earn money and purchase their freedom and purchase the freedom of their children or their spouse. So you could do that in the ancient world as well. It could also be granted to them. The master could die, for example, and free all of his slaves at the time of his death. What is interesting, though, is that when it comes to our liberation from the power of sin, from the slavery that we have, none of those things work. Paul is very clear. You and I cannot earn our freedom from sin. Try as you might, it will not work. You cannot purchase your freedom. How good do you have to be in order to become a citizen of the kingdom of God? Anybody know? Perfect. 
Jesus said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And here's the problem with that. Even if you and I could be perfect from this point forward to the end of our lives, we would still have to deal with all of the sins that we've committed before this point. So it is perfectly possible, Paul, impossible, Paul says, to purchase your freedom. You can't earn it. You can't purchase it. Your only hope is to have it what? Granted to you. Granted to you. This is one of the reasons why that great hymn, Rock of Ages, I think we sometimes think of it as a Baptist hymn. You know, Rock of Ages. It's not in the Episcopal hymnal. But let me tell you something. It was written by an Anglican. Augustus Toplady was an Anglican. So take that, Baptist Church. (laughs) But listen to these three stanzas because it sums up the human condition and the only hope that we have. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure, cleanse me from its guilt and power. Second stanza is critical. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. Paul knew that he was a slave to sin. He was a slave to unrighteousness. He knew that his only hope was in Jesus Christ. But here's the interesting thing. When you cease being a slave to sin, that does not mean that you cease being a slave. What happens is that you cease to be a slave to sin and you become a slave to righteousness. You become a slave to Jesus Christ. Ray Stedman, who was a great pastor out in Palo Alto, California, back in the 70s and the 80s, tells the story of how he was walking down a street in California one day, I think it was in San Francisco, and he saw a man coming toward him wearing a sandwich board. You ever see people like that wearing, wearing a sandwich board? And on the front, it had a sign that said, I'm a slave for Christ. And Ray Stedman said, I I confess that when I saw this guy coming toward me, he looked a little disheveled and so forth, I I crossed to the other side of the street to avoid him. He said, but I was curious, what was on the backside of that sandwich board? And he said, as the man passed by, I looked back, and on the reverse of the sandwich board were these words, whose slave are you? I'm a slave to Jesus Christ, whose slave are you? And Stedman said, that's it. You and I are slaves, but we're either slaves to sin, which leads to death, or we're slaves to righteousness, which leads to life. So that's what Paul is describing. He's saying, look, I'm a slave for Christ. Whose slave are you? But none of us, my friends, none of us is truly free unless the master sets us free. And it's not free to do anything we want It's free to do the things that up to that point we were incapable of doing. That's true freedom. Uh, The best way I can describe this, and I think I've used this illustration before, is I had a seminary professor who um, grew up, and his mother forced him to take piano lessons. And uh, he hated it. And uh, he and his sister had to take piano lessons. They, They despised it. And he said every day I would go in there, forced to sit down at the keyboard and play the piano. And he said, I hated it, and I would see my friends going by in the window with their baseballs and their their bats, and they're ready to have a pickup game, and my mother's making me be enslaved, that's the way he put it, to the piano. He said, finally, I made my my mother's life so miserable that she said, you know, Dick, if you don't want to do it anymore, you're free. Go. Get out of here. And he said, I was free, free from the piano. And he said, I went out and I played baseball. He said, my sister was much more dutiful. She kept at it year after year. He said, and she sounded terrible. He said, I mean, when she played, it sounded like she was wearing boxing gloves. It was just awful. (laughs) He said, but years later, we were having a big family reunion. It was around Christmas. And somebody said, I think we need to sing some Christmas carols. Um, And they called on my sister. They said, Mary, why don't you come up here and, and play the piano? And Dick said, you know, I, I've been with my sister over the years, but the truth be known, I, I hadn't heard her play the piano in years. 
And he said, my memories of her playing the piano were not good. He said, but she sat down at that piano and she played the most beautiful music. He said, if I had to sit down at that keyboard and play one of those Christmas carols, he said, I would have been a complete failure. He said, and it suddenly dawned on me, she, having been enslaved to the piano, at least that was the way I looked at it, was actually free. She could sit down at that keyboard and make it do anything she wanted it to do. That's what happens when we become slaves to Jesus Christ. The world says, well, that's, you know, bondage. But we realize that by being enslaved to Christ, what we actually find by the power of the Holy Spirit is the wherewithal, the ability to suddenly do the things that we were incapable of doing before, loving one another, forgiving one another, being compassionate toward one another. Those are things that do not come naturally to any of us, but when you're enslaved to Christ, you suddenly suddenly found yourself liberated and able to do those things you were not capable of doing before. So when Paul describes himself as a slave to Christ, that's what he means. Yes, to the world it looks like bondage, but in reality it's true liberation. How about you? Have you ever been liberated? You're a slave. Nobody's truly free in this world. If you think you are truly free, then just wait. You're enslaved to your body. You're enslaved ultimately to death. We're all slaves. You only become free if the master sets you free. But Paul not only describes himself as a servant of Christ Jesus, he writes to the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. Now, I said every one of these words is pregnant with meaning, and that is the case with the word saint. The word literally translated means sanctified one, To be a sanctified one means to be set aside for a purpose. That's what it really means. A saint is someone who's been set aside for a specific purpose. It is not a special class of Christian. When you think of a saint, what do you think of? Who's the first person that pops into your mind, aside from the rector? (laughs) Who's the first person that pops into your mind? Mother Teresa. I mean, generally, that's what most people say. Mother Teresa. That's a perfect example of a saint. And why is Mother Teresa a saint? Well, the answer is because of all the wonderful things she did for other people, she's a saint. Because that's what we think of. A saint is somebody who does remarkable things, and as a consequence of their hard work, their efforts on behalf of others or on behalf of God, they go through this process of apotheosis by which they become miraculously a saint, and they achieve this coveted status. Uh, The Roman Catholic Church actually has a process by which a person becomes a saint. It's a process of canonization, and it is long and elaborate. If a person is going to be elevated to sainthood, there are a number of things that have to happen. First of all, they have to have lived a worthy life, Second of all, they have to have performed some miracle or some miracle has to have been performed in their name following their death. And then there is actually a trial where there will be an advocate on one side who will present all the merits before an ecclesiastical court, all the merits of the individual. And then, of course, you can't just present their merits. You have to present their demerits. And so there is an advocate on the other side who is called, listen to this, the devil's advocate. That's where the expression comes from. So you have an advocate on the one side that is speaking to the person's merits. You have somebody on the opposite side who is speaking to their demerits, the devil's advocate. And then what happens is the court votes on it. And then they go through a process of beatification, and it still goes on until eventually you are declared to be a saint. It is a long, drawn-out process, and it all depends upon what? The person's works, their accomplishments. And when most of us think of a saint, that's what we think of. We say, oh, she was married to a very difficult man. She's a saint. Isn't that the way we speak of it today? I mean, let's be honest. That's what we think of when we think of a saint. We think of somebody 
who is a super Christian. Well, I want to correct that view because the Bible is very clear. The New Testament is very clear. A saint and a Christian are the same thing. Martin Luther put it this way. He said, there's no higher-ranking Christian than the baptized Christian. Uh, Somebody, um, when I first got here, asked me, what did I want to be called? And I said, well, my name's Jeff. You know, in some churches, they they, they stand on titles and that sort of thing. I really don't. I'm I'm perfectly happy. Now, if you come from a tradition where you, you just feel uncomfortable calling the minister by their first name and you want to call me Father Miller or whatever, that's fine. But I'm perfectly happy with Jeff. Why? Because there's no higher-ranking Christian than the baptized Christian. I have a different role in the body of Christ than you do, but there's no higher rank. Christians and saints are interchangeable. They are the same thing. You want to see a saint? You, you, you You want to see a saint? Look around this room. Every Christian in this room is a saint. You are someone who's been set aside for a purpose. So, Saint M is sitting up here on the front row. (laughs) And it's not by virtue of anything that she has done. It's by virtue of what Christ has done on her behalf. That's what Paul is saying. So he's he's writing to these people in Philippi, Philippi, and he's calling them saints. Now, that doesn't mean that they're perfect. How many of you have discovered in your life in the church that Christians are not perfect people? (laughs) Saints are not perfect people. Saints are redeemed people. They are sanctified people. They have been set aside for a purpose. They have been justified, declared righteous, and now by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, God is beginning to change them into the very thing that they have been declared to be. And that process of sanctification, my friends, is a lifelong process. You never arrive until you cross that threshold and step into heaven when we become like him. So God declares us righteous on the basis of grace through faith. He then begins to, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, turn us into the thing that he's declared us to be. But we are, by virtue of the fact that we are Christians, saints. That being the case, would you treat a saint differently than you would treat somebody else? As brothers and sisters in Christ, we ought to treat each other with the greatest of respect. So Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus, writing to the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. Uh, These are words that are of importance to us. The word that is translated here as overseer, sometimes uh, in other translations is the word elder. But the Greek word is one that you should be familiar with. It is the word episkopos. What does that sound like? Episcopal. Episkopos, episcopal. Small e, not big e. Small e, episkopos. It literally, in English, we would translate that as Bishop. And and you can even see how it came from that. Episcopos bishop. That's how the word eventually came down to us. So he's writing to those who are called to be saints. The whole company of believers there in Philippi were saints. But there were some who were overseers, episcopos, and some who were deacons. The Greek word there is diakonos. And it literally means one who waits at table. Now, I want to keep your finger there in Philippians for a moment, and I want you to turn back to Acts for just a moment because I think there's something very important here. There is a third word. It's not used in this particular passage, but it is used elsewhere in the New Testament, and some people have made a distinction between two of the terms. The third term is presbyteros. It can also be translated as elder or overseer. It's the word that Jesus uses in Matthew chapter 15. And in Titus, Paul's letter to Titus, he uses episkopos and presbyteros interchangeably. Presbyteros is also a word that should be familiar to you. Where do we, what do we get from that? Presbyterian, that's right. 
So you have three groups of leaders in the church that Paul is addressing. The episkopos, the overseers, the presbyteros, the elders, and the diaconos, the deacons. Now they're all saints, they're all Christians, but Paul is telling us that there are different roles within the body of Christ. What are those roles? Well, if you take a look at Acts for just a moment, chapter 6, you get a picture of what life was like in the early church and the role in particular of the episkopos and the diaconos. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. Now, in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, the disciples here does not mean the 12, it means all the followers. Disciple could be translated as saint or Christian here in that passage. The church in those early days was growing exponentially. Do you realize how quickly the church grew in those days? I mean, they had a problem, and it was a church growth problem. We're told there were about 120 believers after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Just about 120. Not many. Those huge crowds up in Galilee have really disintegrated. There's only about 120 believers is the way Acts chapter 1 describes it. Until Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, Peter stood up, delivered this magnificent sermon, and we're told that 3,000 were added to the number on that day. Now, the church ran, went from 120 people to 3,120 people in one day. Now, you say to yourself, praise the Lord, what a wonderful thing, but that's going to create problems. And it did create problems. Good problems, but problems nevertheless. And problems that absolutely had to be addressed. And that's what Acts chapter 6 is all about. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint. Every pastor understands this. A complaint by the Hellenist, that is, the Greek-speaking Jews, arose against the Hebrews, the Aramaic-speaking Jews, because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Moms not being visited at home. People aren't, the apostles aren't going to the hospital and visiting the sick. So what did they do? Look at this. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. They set before These they set before the apostles, and they prayed, and they laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. The job of the deacon was to do what? To serve, but how? Physically, yes, but how? The job of the deacon was to do everything that was necessary to free up the apostles to do their job, which was what? To preach the gospel and to say their prayers. So Paul is saying the primary responsibility of the overseer, the primary responsibility of the elder is to do what? Preach and teach the word. Because if there's one thing that the church needs most, it needs to hear a word from the Lord. I'm going to say this at the annual meeting. The true sign of a spirit-filled church is a church that applies itself to the study of God's word. And a church that does not do that will never be truly spirit-filled. So the apostles devoted themselves to the apostles, to to the teaching, to the preaching, and the deacons were formed to do everything else, basically to free up the apostles so that they could devote themselves to their job. This just reminds us that not everybody in the church is called to do exactly the same thing. You all have a diaconal ministry in the life of the church. 
Paul says the body has many parts. That's the way he describes it, as a body. But the body has to work together. The hand cannot say to the foot, I have no need of you. In fact, he says the parts that we don't think are of great significance actually do have great significance. And if those smaller parts are in pain or are not working, then the whole body suffers as a consequence. Now, you know this practically speaking. This image of the body is a powerful one. You get up in the middle of the night. You know, you reach a certain age where you can't go the whole way through the night without using the toilet. So you get up in the middle of the night, and you're trying not to wake your spouse, and you're going to the bathroom, and you stub your toe on the corner of the bed. How many of you just sit there and say, well, it's just a little toe? Not a big deal. You're trying to not wake up your spouse, but that's the very thing you do. You know that. And that is because even though it's the smallest part of the body, it nevertheless is in pain. And when it's in pain, the whole body's in pain. And so Paul is saying, he's addressing the overseers and the deacons. We're all saints. We all have a common cause, but we all have a different role in the body of Christ. And if the church is going to be effective in sharing the gospel with the world, the clergy can't do it all. So often, we treat Christianity as though it's a spectator sport. Question. How many people are on a football field? 22 people on a football field. How many people at an NFL game are up in the stands? Thousands. Thousands. Listen, that's the way many people look at church. You got 22 people down there on the field beating each other to a pulp and 22,000 up there doing nothing but cheering them on. And that's the way oftentimes the church operates. I actually had somebody come up to me on one occasion and say to me, I'm not going to tell you which congregation, but somebody actually came up to me at one point and poked me in the chest and said to me, you know, he was unhappy with something. And he came up to me, and he actually showed up at my house. My wife was there, and uh, he poked me in the chest. My wife saw him there. She quickly went into the dining room because she said, I said, why did you leave? And she said, because if you were going to punch him in the nose, I didn't want to be a witness to it. So <laughs> at any rate, he came up. He was really angry about something, upset about something, felt that he needed to come and tell me. It was Christmas Eve, by the way. And so he, he's letting me have it, and he's going. And at one point, he says, you know... You work for us. To which I replied, no, I don't. And this didn't make it any better, I confess to you. <laughs> I said, you simply have the privilege of paying my salary. That did not help the situation. Um, I said, no, I don't work for you. I said, I work for the Lord. I work with the vestry, and we work for the congregation. So I'm really answerable to God. But I work with the leadership of the church and we work for the sake of the congregation to build up the saints for the work of ministry. And see, if everybody is doing their part, then the body flourishes. But if I'm not doing my part, then the deacons can't do their part. And if the deacons can't do their part, then what happens to the rest of the saints? We all suffer as a consequence. So it's really interesting. In just these first two verses, Paul talks about what it means to be a Christian. It means to be a saint, somebody who's been set apart for a purpose. And that purpose is to what? To live no longer unto themselves, but to live for the sake of Christ. And he speaks of the overseers and the deacons. And in elsewhere, he speaks of the presbyteros, the diversity of gifts. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4 for just a moment, and you'll get a picture of this. Paul uses a wonderful image. Chapter 4, beginning at verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves 
and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So Paul says we all have a role to play. The roles are not the same, but we all have an important role to play. Having spoken about saints, going back now to Philippians, having spoken about the saints, about the servants, about the overseers and the deacons, Paul then gives this customary greeting, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the word that is translated here as grace is um, a, a typical greeting in the ancient world. Uh, if the emperor, for example, the emperor Tiberius was writing a letter, a missive to the people of Alexandria, he would give all of his titles. He would say Tiberius, emperor, uh, king of the Romans, whatever it may be, and then he'd get to the end to the people in Alexandria, greetings. That was the typical way of writing letters. But as I said... Paul puts an atypical Christian twist on what would be a normal pattern for writing a letter. What is interesting is that in normal Gentile greetings, this word that is translated as grace is always in the verb form. When Paul uses it, he uses it in the noun form. Charis. It's the word from which we get charity, incidentally. And Paul is really saying the grace, not just greetings, but the grace. Not just grace, but a specific grace. The grace of God. That's how Paul uses the term. And what is interesting is that he also uses the word peace. Now, here's where Paul does something really unusual. He uses, he's writing in Greek, <laughs> and he uses a Greek word for grace, but when he uses the word peace, he uses a Hebrew word. The Hebrew word is shalom. Shalom. Um, this is a greeting even in Israel today. If you go to Israel, to the Holy Land today, you come down in the morning, there's somebody working at the front desk of your hotel, you don't say good morning to them, you say shalom. It, it's a form of greeting, but it means peace. Peace be with you. But the Hebrews had a very specific understanding of the kind of peace. When we think of peace, we think of an absence of conflict. That's not what they meant. Peace to them meant total peace. Peace of heart, peace of mind. Yes, the absence of conflict, but more than that. It was that peace which passes human understanding, the peace of God. So Paul is writing as a servant of Christ Jesus to the saints, and he says, may the grace of God, the grace... And the peace of God be with you. Now, what is grace? All right, so we've got somebody here's the star pupil in the front row. <laughs> grace, when we think of grace, oftentimes we think of somebody who has poise in the midst of adversity. Grace under fire. That's not the biblical understanding of grace at all. Grace in the New Testament means God's undeserved, unearned favor. There's nothing you can do to earn it. It's unmerited favor. Now, this is one of Paul's major themes. In Romans chapter 5, he says, God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I want you to think about that. God demonstrates, God shows his love for us in this that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When did Christ die for us? When we managed to clean up our act? When we managed to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps? When we managed to sort of get rid of those besetting sins in our lives, then we became worthy of Christ's death on the cross for us? No. God shows his love for us in that he dies when? When we were still sinners. You see, that's unmerited, undeserved, 
favor. You and I don't do anything to get it. God gives it to us freely. This is why Paul says we are saved by grace through faith and not by works. Because in Ephesians he says, as for you, you were dead in your trespasses and in your sins. He doesn't say you were sick. He says you were dead. Here's the question. How much good can a dead person do? But God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive even when we were dead. It is by grace that you have been saved. Paul knew that to be true in his own life. Now, this relates very closely, and I'm not going to go into this because this is a whole can of worms, but this relates very closely to Paul's doctrine of election. That we really didn't choose God, God chose us before the foundations of the earth. And one of the reasons Paul knew that to be true in his own life is because Paul knew he would never have chosen Christ. Christ interrupted him on that road to Damascus. And I think if most of us look back over the course of our lives, we would have to admit that left to our own devices, we would never have chosen Christ. The attractions of this world, the pull of this world are too great. But God, who is rich in mercy, did what? Maybe put somebody in your path. Maybe led you to a church or put you into a family where your parents were faithful believers and you were raised in that kind of an environment. But there comes a point where God interrupts your life. And that is grace. That's why John Newton was able to write, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. So Paul is reminding these servants, these slaves of Christ Jesus, that they have been purchased at countless cost. And they now have peace with God. And because they have peace with God, they can now enjoy the peace of God. That peace which passes human understanding. What I want you to notice is that grace always precedes peace. God takes the initiative. He shows unmerited favor toward us. We in respond by faith, and God gives to us that which the world cannot give, that which the world cannot understand, that peace which passes human understanding. Do you have that in your own life? We live such frantic lifestyles. We're always looking for peace. It is so elusive in our day. But what God wants us to have is that peace which passes human understanding. The world can be going to hell in a handbasket. You may be concerned about the next political election, but you know that there is one who is in control, who has saved you by his grace, and will safely lead you home. In two verses... Paul says all of that. Isn't it amazing? All of those words pregnant with meaning and with value for you and for me in our life as the followers of Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian, God has already declared you to be a saint. So take heart in that. You're saved not by your works. You're saved by his grace. You are a saint. You've been set aside. Now pray that God will begin to turn you into the thing that he's declared you to be. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these two verses from Philippians, just from the introduction, two verses that we would be quick to run by, but verses that are filled with meaning and value, both spiritual and practical for our lives. Help us to remember, Lord, that We don't have to do every task in the life of the church, but we do all have a role to play. And grant us the grace, Lord, to play that role to the best of our ability, that the body may be built up, that the saints may be equipped for the work of ministry. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.